coolant down there in your radiator. What a bullshit term, I'd suggest. Coolant. Details next. Okay, so one last beer garden physics brain bleed before we usher in the new year. <laughs> Yes, I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where... Shane. New car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. As you may know, the automotive industry is famous for its production of bullshit across several domains, including that of applied science. We have so-called radiators that reject heat, waste heat at least, mainly by convection and not radiation, overwhelmingly, and so-called shock absorbers that really don't absorb road-going shocks. That's what springs are designed to do. The term coolant, I'd suggest, even worse. We'll get to that in just moments and what that green stuff really does. Today's cavalcade of intracranial beer garden bleeds is inspired by several covert thermodynamicists and geography laureates hidden among us in the YouTube comments feed. Yes, these people have once again rekindled my hatred of yet another classic bullshit automotive term. Coolant. Thong bikinis are such a waste of material. And stop saying water, it's coolant. And why don't you celebrate Christmas on June 25 at the beginning of winter? Just to address these peripheral but nonetheless important automotive issues. Christmas. Even here in the mentally retarded southern hemisphere where the Coriolis acceleration does mad things to our minds, June 25 really would not actually constitute the proper fake birthday of the fake son of the fake Christian God, I think you'd agree. And even though we're a proud secular democracy here in Shitsville, with the federal government of ratbag right-wing god-bothering lawyer assholes who flee by example every time the country burns, such as right now, I think it's very important that we keep our Bronze Age bullshit globally harmonised. And I hope you agree, my fellow Shitsvillians. Secondly, I disagree strongly here on the vexed question of the thong bikini and it being a waste. Sometimes, I'd suggest, less really is more, at least in my view. And I have spent a great deal of time testing various hypotheses, uh, hypotheses is, 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 on this issue, this vexed issue. None of it wasted, I think you'd agree, this time. The thong bikini, of course, you might remember from high school, successfully developed by proud Australian fashion luminary Seymour Butts. While he was on holiday at Indonesia's stink bug eradication paradise, Bintan Island. <sighs> Excuse me. I have to dig deep increasingly. Really? Is that actually a place? Because I've only ever been there in my friggin' dreams, baby. Yes, obviously you were there, and only you. Trust me on this. Okay, I'll make an appropriate correction in the interest of maintaining this outstanding channel's laudable commitment to the highest of editorial standards. Yes. What's that? Oh, I love you too, darling. Yeah, okay, gotta go. Bye. That wasn't so bad. I hate it when they do that. I'm being told the thong bikini was actually invented on a nearby island in exactly the same Indonesian archipelago. Puntang Island. Bintang Island? Isn't that just a fancy name for Bali? No, Tone. 
It's not, mate. Bali is most definitely Poontang Island. Trust me on this. I just looked it up on TripAdvisor. live from Puntang Island yesterday. Such an awesome place, I think you'd agree. I'd suggest if they taught applied physics using this kind of cognitive warm-up technique, using hotties and humour, everyone would get it. Except feminists and vegans, of course, but who cares if they die out? Just one 15-second Puntang Island break every half hour is all you need to optimise your neuroplasticity according to my exhaustive tests. Now it's time to pay, okay? Coolant, cue the engineering soapbox right now and pour yourself a beer. Best make it a pint. That red or green stuff that you put in your radiator mixed with deionized water, it's commonly called coolant, but that's one of the worst bullshit names ever. A TTF, or Total Taxonomy Fail. Not that it's not important stuff. It is. It's important for its anti-freeze properties. It's important for its anti-corrosive properties, of course. But it actually makes the fluid itself worse at transporting heat. And it's harder to pump. So it's anti-fucking coolant when you think about it, because water is already the perfect common substance for the transportation of heat. It's the best commonly available thing for holding heat energy by a mile. Ethylene glycol is perhaps the Coca-Cola of the so-called coolant brigade, that's the green stuff, and its main function is to stop the fluid from freezing in winter, because water expands when it freezes, problematically. Just to spell this out, okay, if you fell asleep in that particular lesson at school, you've got hot water in the car's cooling system, in part, and if you've just been driving, obviously, it's fairly hot indeed. It contracts as it cools in ambient air after you shut down, provided it's cold outside, and when it gets to just above the freezing point, this actually occurs at 4 degrees C, it stops contracting and it starts to expand. Oops a daisy, and when it freezes, it expands by a total of nine frigging percent, which is more than enough to crack the head or the block or the radiator, or all three, if you win the trifecta. Happily though, a 50% shandy of water and ethylene glycol laughs out loud at zero degrees C, which is minus 32 F, Marika. This mixture will not freeze until it gets down to about minus 35 degrees C, which coincidentally is about minus 35 F also. So that's nice and protective in most parts of the world in the middle of winter, but obviously not everywhere, but certainly okay here in Australia. Unfortunately, though, the mixture is just not as good at 100 as, as, at as, they look the same at this distance, let me tell you. It's just not as good as 100% water at its primary job of moving heat out of the engine and into the appallingly named radiator, which actually cools by convection. Very good explanation. Now it's time for me, as a commentor, to pick some nits. Another reason coolant doesn't boil is it is not just water. It is a mixture of water and antifreeze. This not only lowers the freezing point, but raises the boiling point. Unfortunately, it also lowers the efficiency of the fluid as a heat removing medium, but not enough to be a problem. Yeah, nah. If you're gonna be a total pedant, I'd suggest you need to get this stuff completely right. However, I did agree with many of Big Kev's statements just up there. Ethylene glycol in water certainly does raise the boiling point a bit. A 50% mix raises the boiling point from 100 degrees C to about 108. That's 227F, America. But frankly, it's quite a shit way to raise the boiling point if that's your only objective. 
just pressurising the system to 15 psi, which is about one atmosphere of gauge pressure, or two atmospheres absolute, and going back to plain old water instead of the shandy, that raises the boiling point to about 120 degrees C, which is 248F miracle. So, if we do both of those things, the 50-50 shandy and the 15 psi pressurisation, it raises the boiling point of the fluid to about 128 degrees C, which is 265F miracle. But the heavy lifting here is done by the pressure increase, okay? The boiling point increase from using ethylene glycol is kind of incidental. It's, it's happy incidental, but it's incidental nonetheless. Unfortunately, a mixture of 50% ethylene glycol and water is going to lose about 15% of the fluid's fundamental ability to hold and transport heat per unit mass of fluid. That's bad. The upshot of this is that when Big Kev says this characteristic of holding less heat is, quote, not enough to be a problem in terms of heat transport efficiency, I would respectfully retort, please tell me that you are not about to design a frigging cooling system for a nuclear reactor or anything else. When engineers design cooling systems, okay, they think about the amount of heat that needs to be rejected by the cooling system in the worst case. So if you've got, I don't know, a fairly average engine, 100 kilowatts at maximum power, it's going to be cranking out 100 kilowatts at the crank. And at that time, about 150 kilowatts of heat is going to need to be rejected by the radiator. And that's rather a lot. It's hard to conceptualise this, OK, if you're an accountant or a bricklayer or the guy who unclogs the sewer and they're all important jobs, especially your job, sewer unclogging dude. No disrespect is intended whatsoever. Next time the shitter is backed up at my house, in the immortal words of Whitney Houston, I, uh, I, I will always love you, ooh, ooh, ooh. I will, I promise. Hope to die, cross my heart, etc. 150 kilowatts of heat, right? That's about 60 power points with the biggest possible heaters all plugged in and all on full deep down there in your engine bay. That's in Australia, obviously, where it's 240 volts and 10 amps maximum for a conventional wall outlet. So you'd consider the worst case ambient temperatures here if you're an engineer and you design the radiator taking into account the highest radiator output temperatures you can foresee because that's kind of important and the maximum permissible operating fluid temperature in the engine because you really don't want the fluid to boil because if it does it kind of doesn't flow properly and that's bad. But whatever else you do, right, if you are using a 50-50 mix of ethylene, glycol and water, you must, and this really is not optional, you must increase the water pump delivery capacity by at least 15% to compensate for the lower heat transport capacity of the mixture compared with just plain old water. That same mix of water and ethylene glycol is also two and a half times more dynamically viscous than water. It's more treacly, if you want the technical term. Maple syrupy, I think it is, if you live in Politistan, up there, north of the Trump insanity. So, you'd want to take all of this into account in designing the radiator and the water galleries and the pump in terms of the overall resistance to flow. If this constitutes, quote, but not enough to be a problem, then it's fair to say the words mean vastly different things on my world compared with big kevs. It's a 15% problem for the pump delivery, okay, and a 250% problem in terms of flow resistance, which are both pretty significant, I think you'd agree, when you're dragging a heavy friggin' trailer up a steep hill at 80 k's an hour into a tailwind on a stinking hot day right up the bum of the B-double. But only if you don't want the vehicle to go poopy in its trousers. And that worst operating case scenario is when cooling systems typically fail catastrophically. Now, I would like briefly to talk to you fucking tragic EV evangelists, you worthless vegans of the automotive landscape. Before you start self-righteously stroking your wedding vegetables in public in the comments feed, 
Kindly do remember that all credible EVs have cooling systems designed to reject waste heat from charging and discharging the batteries, and also, I think, to temperature control the inverter. And exactly the same issues pertain to those cooling systems, although they do tend to be somewhat smaller. So there's that. In a nutshell, coolant is breathtakingly bullshit as a term for that coloured crap in your radiator. The additives are absolutely there for vitally important reasons. They are primarily antifreeze properties and corrosion resistance. And this is important too because aluminium and iron in the presence of an electrolyte is otherwise quite a bad idea. But in terms of cooling performance in isolation, plain old water would be substantially better. But not the water on Poontang Island, okay? It's always very warm there. They warm it up every day, first thing in the morning. It's Sparrow's Fart. I've never actually heard one of those, but I, I understand it happens early, generally before I rise, and that explains for the deficiency in my knowledge about the specifics. Whatever. But they warm it up first thing, Sparrow's Fart, in the traditional way, organically, using hotties, as I understand it. And you have to admire tradition, I think. And hotties, if you know what's good for you. Happy 2020.